Due to circumstances beyond our control, the next speaker did show up. <laughs> another one after that. We're very, very pleased to uh, welcome and introduce Brother Terry Varner. At uh, this point in his preaching career, the things he's doing uh, seem to have been inevitable, inevitable for somebody who is such a noted mind, such a good student, such a prolific writer. And he has been preaching the gospel and teaching for many years. And currently, he is the preacher over at West Union, also serves as an elder there. And we are very fortunate to have him from the beginning of this school as an instructor here. And he also serves as the research coordinator for the Warren Center, <coughs> Christian Apologetics Center, and also edits the uh, paper, Sufficient Evidence, a journal of Christian apologetics. And I mentioned he is a prolific writer. He is uh, married to Lily and uh, they have three sons and, and several grandkids and so on and so forth, things such as that. But we're, we're very pleased to welcome him and look forward to hearing him speak to us on the assisted life from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 30. Brother Terry. Okay. you decide the speaking and God decide the living. <laughs> now listen folks, he talked about me showing up. It was not me that was awarded in the lectures a procrastination award <laughs> one year. Do you forget that? your Bibles to Romans 8. We're going to be in 26 through 30. I enjoyed the last lecture. The last lecture was based on God's Word and it should motivate us to live, love, and serve God. Have you heard about the city slicker that decided to buy a farm? And he bought a farm, and after he had been on the farm a few days, he decided he wanted to get a horse. So he let the word out that he was going to need a horse and an old farmer called him and said, I have a horse that you can buy. He doesn't look too good. And so the man went, inquired of the farmer of the horse and he bought him. And he brought him home and the next morning he said uh, to his wife, he said, I've got to go see that farmer that sold me that horse. She didn't question him. And he got back to the farmer that sold him the horse, and he said, listen, you sold me a horse that was blind. He says, and you didn't tell me. And the old farmer looked at him, and he said, I did tell you he was blind. He said, no, you didn't. And they argued and back and forth, and the farmer said, listen, I told you he didn't look too good. <laughs> when we get done today <coughs> dealing with the assisted life that with our life as a Christian 
we look good to God and that we're righteous as we ought to be and holy and godly and that we maintain that hope of eternal life where we can feast in heaven at the Lamb's Supper. Our theme is, and the lesson, is the assisted life from Romans 8, 26 through 30. And the very title suggests to us that Christians ought not to be overly disturbed by the difficulties of life, nor should they feel that they are self-sufficient in living life. By self-sufficient, I mean getting to the point where we feel that we do not need God, that we do not need a spiritual relationship as we try to walk through life. God the Father has not left us alone to cope with the weaknesses, the trials and the tribulations, even the good times in our lives. But he's given us power. He's given us the power of providence. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit's intercession to help us cope. So two points is all my lesson really involves. First, the Holy Spirit assists the Christian, Romans 8, 26 and 27. And secondly, God's power and God's providence assists the Christian as he lives his life. In 26, the scripture says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Notice in 26 the word likewise, or as the American Standard would say, in like manner, and also the word also. Likewise, the Spirit also suggests a comparison in our assisted life. And I would suggest to you that earlier in the book of Romans, like in 16 and 17, he compares the intercession of the Spirit and what he does for us in life in what our sonship in Christ does for us as a Christian. And the second thing that I would suggest to you in Romans 8 and verse 24, he says, we have a hope a hope, desire plus expectation that we're going to be saved, enjoy heaven and eternity with God Almighty. But in this 26th verse, he said, the Spirit also helpeth our weaknesses. Notice weaknesses is plural. Is not talking about just one thing. There are a number of things that we as children of God need encouragement, assistance, and strength as we live our life for God Almighty. I want to notice first of all, he uses the word us. And Paul then includes himself with the Christians at Rome. Now Paul had been baptized with the Holy Spirit, but the Paul's baptism of the Holy Spirit did not in any way affect Paul's spiritual life. It didn't make him live faithful, except to write faithfully. 
It didn't make him to speak for God except to write accurately and inerrantly. But when it came for him living, he had to live life as did all the apostles as all Christians have to do. So he says here very clearly, the Holy Spirit also helps our weaknesses. The indwelling of the Spirit in conjunction with the Word of God helped Paul's prayer life just as it helps our prayer life. The verb helps is a most uncommon verb in this text. I want to read you a statement and a, from Guy N. Woods dealing with this verb. And think what he's saying. Quote, it is of interest to observe that this verb occurs only one other time in the Greek text. In the narrative of Luke 10 and verse 40, when Martha vexed and cumbered with much serving and annoyed because of Mary's uncooperativeness, asked Jesus to bid Mary to help to stand over on the opposite side and take hold of the work so that the two of us together can get the job done. Was Martha attempting, he says, to move a heavy table at the very moment that she addressed these words to the Savior? Did she also point to the table which she requested Jesus to bid Mary to take hold of on the other side and help her? We may believe that such was so, for this is a picture drawn from the Greek word. The Spirit helps us. He stands over against us, as it were, and lifts with us until our united efforts of our burdens are lifted. Our translation, slightly expanded to indicate the full significance of the term, runs. Likewise, also the Spirit takes hold along with me and helps us bear our earthly afflictions. The Holy Spirit is stated in this text of verse 26 to assist in our weaknesses. Weaknesses means without strength. Weaknesses means weak. It was used of Paul when Paul, or when uh, used by Paul when he wrote earlier, for when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. That's found in Romans 5, 6. But without strength is the word weaknesses in Romans 8 and verse 26. The question arises, what is the Christian's weakness? What is our infirmity? What is it that the Spirit helps us with? And Paul answers by inspiration, for we know not how to pray as we ought. Paul did not say that we didn't pray. He just said that there are circumstances, there are situations, there are times in our lives in which we simply cannot pray and pray as we ought. But that the Holy Spirit helps us in that. We're instructed as Christians to have a prayer life. We're instructed in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. We're instructed in 1 Timothy 2.1, pray for all men. We're instructed in James 1 and verse 5 to pray for wisdom. We're instructed in Hebrews 4 and verse 16 to come to the throne of grace with boldness and obtain mercy and peace to help in time of need. But on the other hand, surely any of us will acknowledge, surely any of us will admit that there are certain situations, there are certain circumstances in life in which you want to pray unto the Father, but you can't utter what you need to pray. Think about it. The text affirms that the Holy Spirit helps us. 
in this situation. He doesn't, or our Father doesn't, expect us to cope with our inadequacy of knowing how to pray in any and all circumstances. He doesn't expect us to live a life totally self-sufficient. Look, I live my life assisted in various ways. Prayer assists me to live my Christian life. Studying the scriptures assists me to lead my Christian life. Taking communion assists me to lead my Christian life. Living a holy, godly life by studying biblical characters assists me in my life. And in my prayer life, and he says here, it's one example of these weaknesses, plural, that the Holy Spirit assists us. He helps us. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. As Christ makes intercession for the Christian in relationship to our salvation. That's what Hebrews 7, 25, 26, Hebrews 9, 24, and a host of other scriptures teach. So also the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the Christian, in this case, in his prayer life, by assisting him. It is a case that the scriptures affirm that both Christ and the Holy Spirit make intercession for us. That's difficult for some people to understand. It ought not be because the scriptures state it clearly. In Christ, the scripture says in Romans 9.34, who also makes intercession for us. We know he's our intercessor. And the Spirit himself makes intercession for us, for the saints according to his will. Romans 8.26 and 7. But what do we mean by intercession? We mean to make an appeal on behalf of another. That's what an intercessor is. That is the meaning of the word intercessor in your New Testament. The Holy Spirit intercedes to God for the Christian. And the fact that he does intercede does not negate the important role of Christ as being intercessor. And neither does it negate the accountability and responsibility that I contribute from my obedience. Now the scripture says that he intercedes with groanings which cannot be uttered. I want you to consider something. The groanings which cannot be uttered is translated in a number of scriptures like this. But through our inarticulate groans, the Spirit himself is pleading for us. New English Bible. Groanings too deep for words. New American Standard Bible and the English Standard Bible. Groanings which cannot be uttered are the words of the Holy Spirit or are they the words of the Christian? I followed this debate through the years. I'll tell you, I'll affirm this. I affirm from the context. I affirm from proper exegesis of the text hermeneutically that the groanings are the Christians rather than the Holy Spirit. Whiteside, who incidentally happened to be a good friend of Paolo's father-in-law, Clifton Inman. Many of you knew Clifton. Clifton Inman went to school in Abilene when Brother Whiteside was a professor there. And he and I often talked over the years because I went to Abilene, but Brother Whiteside was then 
dead. And he told me of his classes. And I would suggest to young preachers and old preachers buy Brother Whiteside's materials. They're well worth your money. He was a great Bible class teacher. And he says this. There are urgings and longings in the heart of the sincere child of God that he cannot express. Does that ring a bell? Have you ever lived life and had a situation in which you couldn't really express your feelings to God? I know you have. Surely you have. If you have been living, functioning, and trying to dedicate your life and commitment to God. And then he goes on. He says, Paul states earlier in the chapter, we ourselves groan within ourselves, Romans 8, 23. Just so, the Holy Spirit sustains us in our weaknesses. He has a feeling of hopelessness, speaking of the Christian, or of a deep need without knowing what really, or what that need really is, or what would meet that need. It is what Paul calls unutterable groanings. Not unuttered groanings, unutterable groanings. J.D. Thomas, who was a professor of the Bible when I attended Abilene in the 50s and later became the head of the Bible department, in his commentary on Romans, and I suggest that's another one you need to pick up. He said these groanings are the untranslatable or, un, or untranslatable into human terminology, but they are deep and they're meaningful. Consider that the Holy Spirit takes our inarticulate thoughts and He refashions or refashions our prayers and He presents them to the Father. That's the meaning of the text. When the Holy Spirit functions in this matter, He makes intercession for us. That's what the text teaches. Moses' Lord, which is another commentary by our brethren that you need to buy, said this, These are deep, real wants of human nature. Our wants not for time merely, but for eternity. The groanings which give inarticulate expression to these wants are not the Spirit's groanings. They're our groanings. But the Spirit so forms and directs them as to make them express our true wants in strict harmony with the Father's will. Now notice 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This verse helps explain the Spirit's intercession. There are three persons involved in that verse. The Christian, God, and the Holy Spirit. The Christian at times prays with untranslatable groanings because he does not know how to pray in the situation and circumstance in which he's at praying. The Holy Spirit intercedes in behalf of the Christian by carrying our untranslatable prayers to the Father and presents them to Him. And in our weaknesses, in our prayer life, His intercession is a distinctive work. It's God who searches the hearts of men, Romans 8, 27. He is described as the one who knows the hearts of mankind, Acts 1, 24. 
He is the one who tests or searches our hearts, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Cottrell, in his commentary, said that if God knows what is in the mind of created beings who are qualitatively different from him and relatively independent of him, then surely he knows what is in the mind of the Spirit himself who is qualitatively equal with God and one in nature with him. That's a good statement. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11 says the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. When he is dealing with inspiration. We have some questions. Who doesn't? About all the details of how the Holy Spirit does this. I don't care how he does it. If he can assist me in my life handling the prayers that I can't know how to utter and he can I'll take scripture I don't under know or I don't know and I don't fully understand Ephesians 3.16 where it says the Holy Spirit strengthens us. Oh yes, He strengthens us in harmony with the Word of God. But how does He do it? I agree with Roper. Roper made this comment on this text. He said, no human illustration is perfect. But of this we can be sure when we pray the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf according to the will of God. Let me ask a question. Have you always in all situations that you have lived life and addressed the Father in prayer been able to articulate your prayers as they ought to be prayed? Think about it. If so, shame on you. And I say shame on you because of this. You're making yourself a better Christian than what the text makes when it says the Christian has weaknesses that the Holy Spirit takes to God in prayer for us. Let me give you some illustrations. I was a young preacher, not married. I had a lady with two children attending the services. Occasionally her husband came. They had marital problems. He left. One Friday night he came back. She had the door locked and said, you're out, stay out. He said, I'm coming through the door and I'm going to kill you. She took the two children and she fled three doors down where I was living with the members of the church. We called the state police and you might as well talk to the wall. We couldn't get them to come. What crime has been committed? None. About daybreak, we heard shot. So I took a 22 pistol and told the brother in Christ it was his. I said, I'll go down and check it out. The man was dead. He'd killed himself. Now the preacher, Varner, has a problem. How do you tell two kids daddy's gone? 
how do you tell a wife, even though she was having marital problems, he's dead? Or you just pray. The words will come to you. Well, they didn't come to this preacher. I had prayer with them. And when I was done, I felt as if I failed. There were things I wanted to say I just didn't know how to say. I had groanings that I couldn't explain. If this text is right, and I'm right in my understanding, the Holy Spirit took those groanings that I had and took them to the throne of God. That's what a text is talking about. How many times have you had personal sickness or got bad news and you needed to pray and you wanted to pray and you prayed and you just didn't have sufficient words? You were like Hezekiah, you rolled against the wall and cried. Your wife has cancer. Your husband got cancer. Somebody's had a heart attack all once unexpected. A child is into dope and dead. You pray. But did you always pray in those type situations with perspicuity? With clarity? No. But your prayers didn't go in vain. The text says that the Holy Spirit maketh intercession for us when we cannot pray as we ought. There are enough preachers here that this ought to hit you square dab between the eyeballs. You don't have to preach very long until there are church problems. Did you ever pray in your home about church problems? Did you ever have church problems that sometimes you really didn't know how to express it to the Father for the wisdom to handle them? If you hadn't, you will. But that's what it's saying. But now let's look at a second point because he talks about God's providence assists the Christian. He said, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. I want you to look at this thing. He said, and you know. You know, I... I have heard brethren say they didn't believe in the providence of God. Let me ask you a question to define no. Do you know you're sitting where you're sitting? Do you have any doubt? Rick, do you have any doubt you're sitting on the fourth pew back? You know. The Bible says we can know that God, or that in all things they work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. How do you know? Brother McGarvey says this, we know partially by experience. Well, that's how you know you're sitting where you're at. You're experiencing it. But then he's talking about divine revelation. He said, we know by experience of providence. And then he says, also by primary revelation from the scriptures. Cecil May has a good book on providence. Cecil May Jr. wrote this. He said, the concept of providence presumed that God is still at work in the world he created. I believe that. 
God is still at work. He answers our prayers. Acts 14, 17 says that the rain that comes down from heaven bears witness that God is. He still works. He still bears evidence. God works providentially. Provide is at the root of the word providence, Brother May says. God does provide good things for his people and his loving care is always behind every action on our behalf. We are to cast our anxieties on God because he cares for us. We've observed that we can believe confidently based on God's promises in scripture that God's at work providing for us. However, Brother May said, we're generally not able to say. Notice he didn't say we can't say. He said we generally are not able to say with certainty whether his providential hand has been directly involved in a specific instance. So also, while we can know through Scripture that the Spirit does certain things, we will not always know how or when or whether he was working in a specific instance. I like what Paul said in the book of Philemon. Perhaps, verse 15. How do you illustrate providence? I tell you, I have wrestled with this for decades. Oh yeah, I can go to the Bible and I can take Joseph and I can take Mordecai and I can take a lot of other things and show you that. But how do you define it that God sometimes works in, in providentially and we don't know it? And then there are other times as he has worked things in our lives, bingo, we know it. Well, let me see if I can give you an illustration, and if I've got a weakness in it, help me. There are a lot of parents in here. You remember when you had a little baby all wrapped up in a blanket? You brought him home from the hospital, and you laid him down in the bed, and then you and your husband went in the living room, kicked back, talked about the new child, and then... Maybe one or both decided, let's go get him and bring him in. He's sleeping, but bring him in and lay him on the couch. That kid didn't know. That boy, that girl, there ain't no it's. That little boy, that little girl never knew you moved him from one, one room to the other. That's one way that God works and we don't know it. But that little baby all at once lets out screams and is awake and he got a dirty diaper. And you look at him and you change that dirty diaper and you cuckoo and you laugh and you grin and you talk and he grins back. And when you're done, he goes back to sleep, comforted. That's when we can look back in our life and we can say, ah, oh, somebody's taking care of us. If you had the time, I got it. I could tell you the work of God providentially in my life. And I'm ever grateful. But look at your text. McGarvey says, well, let me give this to McGarvey. McGarvey says that God overrules our own acts, both good and bad, and those of our friends, and brings us out at the end of our lives, shaped and molded as he desires that we be. So he works together for good. That doesn't necessarily mean that all things are pleasant, Experiences of life can be good without being pleasant. You want an example of that? 
something good and wasn't pleasant, take Mordecai. That wasn't very good to begin with, but it turned out pleasant. But you know, some things can be good and pleasant at the same time. Psalm 133, or 133 in verse 1. Behold now, or behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. I'd suggest that all preachers reread Brother McGarvey's two lessons and his sermons on providence. I'd suggest not just preachers, but Christians do it. One's on Joseph and the other's on Esther. Can you see providence in your life? Let me give you an example. When I was in Dunbar, West Virginia, I had a member of the church, a faithful lady, that it, in the hospital. I went to see her. Made a pastoral call. She had a lady beside her in the other bed. From where I lived and where this woman lived in Dunbar. I introduced myself to her, talked to her a little bit. We had prayer for both the ladies. And as I was leaving, I said to the lady, I said, why don't you join us at Dunbar in the ladies' Bible class on Thursday morning? Well, lo and behold, one Thursday morning, she shows up. And we converted her. Shortly after I left Dunbar, she got stuck in with cancer and died, and I had to go back for her funeral. But I see all kind of providence in that. She could have been in any room of the hospital, but she was in a room with a faithful Christian woman. Anybody could have walked in and talked to her, but a child of God walked in, talked to her, and said, Would you like prayer? Come to church. Anybody could walk to the church building and attended services, but she came on an invitation to come. Now you tell me that's all chance. And I tell you, you're not reading the scriptures with the depth of faith that we need to read it. God worked providentially in the ways that I mentioned and in ways I don't even no, in her life. Well, my time about gone. And he said five after. Give me two minutes. Because I got to deal with this last section. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's about three sermons. Let me do it like this. Before the creation of the heavens and earth, God had a biblical worldview. He created the heavens and the earth, and when he created Adam and Eve, he set forth his biblical worldview, Genesis 2.15. They're all relational. There are three points. He said, I have a garden you put in it, and you're to take care of it. We have a relationship to the earth that we don't abuse it, but that we care for it. Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 says, While you're tending the garden, you can eat of every tree that's therein, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. We have a relationship to obey God. 
verse 17 says. And God said it was not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helpmate. And he says we have a relationship with our fellow human beings. And then he began to unfold his redemptive system that culminates in Christianity. Roy Deaver had this statement. I read it and then I quit. To those who would accept the invitation, God purposed the, to grant justification, complete forgiveness of sin. In Acts 2, Peter announced the invitation. The people asked what to do, and Peter said, Repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ under the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To those who would accept the invitation, they have come to have justification. And God purposed in his mind in eternity to grant ultimately the glorification, the glory that shall be revealed. The glorification is, is confirmation to the image of the Son, good and conform to the image of his Son, and glorification all mean the same thing. There's a chain in the Scripture. Foreknow, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. And as Cottrell says, each of these is a distinctive act. And in the redemptive process, they do follow one another in this sequence. I thank you.